<laughs> Susan Meisner is doing double duty on this season's Fosse Verdon. She not only plays uh, Fosse's ex-wife, Joan McCracken, she also choreographs uh, several episodes of the series. I'm Tony Ruiz from Gold Derby, and Susan joins me. And, and Susan, when you've been in theater and dancing and performing and acting for a long time. So I'm wondering, I'm curious as to what was your first exposure? What was your first, do you remember your first recognition of who Bob Fosse and Gwen Verdon were? Oh, my first recognition. That's a great one. Um, hmm. Yeah, I think that my first exposure might have been watching um, Damn Yankees, the movie. And <laughs> I fell in love with Gwen Verdon. I was like, oh, that, that, that little outfit. And she was so able to be both coy. Uh -oh. Are you still there? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So my phone just said there's a flash flood in my air in New York City right now in New Jersey. I'm in Jersey City. So they're like oh, doing an emergency boy. alert in our area. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone stay inside, I guess. <laughs> you stay inside. <laughs> yeah. And watch Damn Yankees again. There you yeah, go. Exactly. I think that was my first exposure. Yeah. To answer your question. So, so, so were you first, were you, it sounds like you actually had more like, uh, additional affinity, more initial affinity with Gwen Verdon than, than Bob. Is that right? You know, I mean, I'm really trying to think back. Yeah, I think so. I think my first introduction was her. And I was like, who is that lady? And and then when I saw who's got the pain and I know, and he was, he's in that with her in that movie. And I was like, my God, that is one of the greatest numbers I've, I've ever, ever, ever seen. And I was quite young when I saw that. Um, and that was, yeah, my first, my first falling in love moment with them. Um, yeah. So, so when this project came along, were, what came first? You choreographing, working on the choreography, or you actually acting in it? Which, which one of those two things came first? Yeah, so I was asked to play Joan McCracken first, and um, I started to do a little bit of a deep dive on that. And then I got a call from Andy Blankenbuehler and Tommy asking me to maybe come in and choreograph the last from episode 104 through 108. Um, so, and yeah, so acting was first and then choreography came second. And I feel really, really lucky that they asked me. And I think it was, yeah, what a humbling experience to work with those guys. Really incredible. So what, so in diving into Joan McCracken, I mean, this is a woman who, who was a star in her own right. She sure was. And, 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 but we see her kind of on the tail end of that. So, so how much research did you do into, into Joan? Yeah, you know, I did as much as I could in the amount of time I had. I didn't have a lot of time from when I got the job to when I had to shoot that part. But um, I was really, really interested in how she sounded. I couldn't find any interviews with her, but so I listened to her sing and she's quite a terrible singer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but she was really a fascinating woman. I mean, she was a woman who for, she was quite wild and there's a story about her. I don't remember if it was a voice lesson or what, but she apparently got hot in a big interview, like actually physically hot. And so she took off her shirt and she was just like in this voice lesson with her shirt off singing, um, which is pretty. And she was very uh, pro women at a, at a time when that wasn't happening. That's actually why she left Hollywood because uh, she thought it was, it was not fair to women. So I think she's a really cool character and she's one of the few people that Bob actually attributes to giving to him more than he gave to her it's of anyone in his life he said she gave more to me than than i ever gave her and there and there's there's also there, there's also uh, i i sensed it in 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 your scenes that there's a tra there's a tragedy to her sure. um you know she's you know she died young um, her career kind of fizzled out, you know, earlier than it probably should have. Did you did you want to incorporate that kind of sense of tragedy into how you played her? Um, did I lose you for a sec? Uh, I'm moving because I have to plug my phone in. Um, <laughs> yes, 
I did. See, this is what a Luddite I am. Um, I did. I think that there, you know, I wanted to, I think that the tragedy actually was inherent in the writing. So I didn't have to do too much work there. But yeah, and I was trying to find some quirkiness because she was so very quirky. But I, I think there was a real sadness to her. And she and Bob remained friends for the rest of her life. And there's a story that actually, he called her at one point in his life and he said, Joni, did you call her Joni? And he said, did you ever think about getting back together? And at this point, Joan had gone to rehab and she was getting herself back on track and trying to stay healthy. And she said, um, no. And so the next day he proposed to Gwen Burden. Oh. Now, yeah, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that is one of the things that actually was in Sam Wasson's book, uh, which I thought was fascinating, really fascinating. And so there was a real love between them, and I think there was a real sadness ab about her life because she was a um, spectacular star, spectacular. And one of the – really yeah. one – Beyond. One of the highlights, you know, for me was was really this very quiet scene between Joan and Gwen, mm. and, and it's almost kind of like a there's there's almost there's so many layers to that scene. Can you kind of talk about what's kind of going on from your point of view in that conversation? Yeah, I thought that scene was so beautifully written, and I wanted to to honor that that writing, um, as as did Michelle, and I thought she was she's so wonderful to work with. Um, what was happening in that scene really was a passing of the baton in a way that I think Joan saw the writing on the wall and she, in this dramaturg, you know, this, this fictional version of this, she saw the writing on the wall and she said, okay, good luck with it. Good luck with handling him because he's a lot and I don't know, I tried my best and maybe you'll do better. And so I think there was a real... I think it was an acknowledgement by two women that they both knew what was going on. Neither one was going to hide it. And they were going to just say, okay, here it is. Did, do, you, do you think that they, that from your point of view, do you think that Joan had this also kind of both this kind of warning of, of Gwen and also this respect for her? Um, I think in the show, that's definitely true. I don't know in real life, to be honest with you, because I know that Joan was a real nurturer and actually so was Gwen. Gwen was a real nurturer. So there's a part of me that I don't really know. But in the show, I definitely think there was some edgy quality between them where, you know, I mean, you're losing your love and you're, 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 able to give them up and I can only imagine what that must feel like. And I wanted to play Joan with as much dignity as I could find for her. I didn't want her to be a crying mess, but I wanted her to, you know, hold it up as much as she could and say, I'm going to do this with pride and I'm going to leave you. You are not going to leave me. And yeah, I'm going to do it with my head up. <laughs> Yeah. So, so let's 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 segue into the into the into the choreography aspect. So, you know, the choreography, Fosse choreography is so specific. So, what 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 kind of training had you had or experience had you had? I mean, you had done the the film version of Chicago that that Rob Marshall had directed, and there certainly is that Fosse you know element in that. But had you ever had any any like training with actual you know, Fosse style dancing? Sure, yes. So way back in the day, a man, a lovely man named Chet Walker did a lot of um, classes preparing for the show Fosse. And I was a part of that sort of team that got in there and got to take these classes with him and learn from him. And, you know, he had assisted Bob in his life and um, he's pretty amazing. And... So, and actually a couple times Gwen came in to the room and to the rehearsals. And so I got some personal, like, I remember her telling me one time, Susie, you have to stir the peanut butter, you have to stir the peanut butter, Susie. And it was basically her way of saying she needed more resistance because it's not easy to stir peanut butter. You know, it's not like this. It's, it's like, Ugh. 
I like that. <laughs> so yeah, so I did. I had a, a and it that was a probably a year long process with Chet of learning, and I was in there with lots of people who had worked with Bob before. Um, and I was watching and copying and learning and, you know, there was a lot, a lot of that, which was fantastic. Yeah. And one of the things I always, I always love to ask this question of, 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 of dancers, especially for, for people who aren't, you know, versed in Fosse, who, for people who aren't even necessarily versed in dance, how would you describe Fosse's style? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think before I'd done this show, I would have described it as sinewy and sexy and, um, but it's not true. The more that I researched him, he was so much broader than, you know, we now associate with what he did. Because I think a lot of people associate with, with the movie Chicago and also the Broadway play Chicago that's still on now. And his work was so much more diverse and he was constantly pulling from his childhood vaudeville years constantly. So I feel like his work is a combination of vaudeville meets sort of sensuality and these, these uh, playing with irony and acting. I think it's, I think it's a combination of those three things, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things that makes that makes I think makes Fosse so unique is that you know it's it's one of those styles where you get character out of movement and it's not just technical. It is technical, obviously, but it's also you know character driven. Yeah, um, that's why I think his work, out of context, is very hard to make sense of. <clears throat> Excuse me, because. Without the character work, it doesn't have as much potency. But like the movie Cabaret to me is kind of a perfect, it's a perfect movie and it's a perfect use of dance in a way that I kind of never see. And so to, to my mind, that's one of his, if not his best piece of work, it might, it, it might be his best one, I think. And certainly one of the best pieces of dance on film ever. So with all of that, with all that in your arsenal, so how how did you approach the choreography for the episodes that that you worked on? Yeah, so I mean, it depended upon what I was being asked to do in the moment, right? But like sometimes I had to dive into his childhood and his inspirations, which were Fred Astaire. He loved Fred Astaire. Um, and Jack Cole was a big influence on him, especially because Gwen was, had studied with Jack and worked with Jack for so long and assisted Jack. So when Gwen came into his life, that shifted how he approached dance. Um, so depending upon the year and what I was doing, like I said, I would go into his childhood. I would look at Fred Astaire stuff. I would look at Charlie Chaplin. I would look at lots of vaudeville um, and see if I could get inside that world but still have my own voice. Uh, and then... When I had to do new stuff, the biggest challenge I talk about was when I had to recreate, not recreate, I had to create his first draft in episode seven of They Both Reach for the Gun. Um, so that had never been done. She was never standing. It was never conceived that way. She was always on his seat. But in this version, in the fictionalized version, we wanted to see her standing and then take that away from her. And so that was a moment where I was like, let me dive into the vaudeville years because that's what he did with Chicago. He really went toward vaudeville and a dark vaudeville. Um, so I, I, and I have to say my biggest compliments are when people are like, no, that was Foss. That, that was originally Fosse, right? And I was like, no, actually that was not. And I'm so, I feel like I, I, maybe I did it. I hope I did it, you know, <laughs> for him. I hope I made him, them, them happy with that because I felt um yeah I felt a lot of pressure to get that one right <laughs> well so so now that now that the show has has finished um it, it brings up an interesting idea of there are all these you know theatrical geniuses that that you know it's such a such a you know immense world of talent and also really interesting personalities is there any other as somebody who does a lot of theater, is is there anybody who you who you think, oh yeah, 
this kind of format would really work to to highlight this person. Is, 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 have any other names come to your mind of people who could oh, who would fit in this? Oh yeah. I mean, how long do you have, Tony? Because <laughs> long. I mean, wow. I mean, let's start with Jerome Robbins, who Fosse himself uh, idolized, absolutely thought. You know, I don't know. There's a quote about, I think Picasso said, and then there was Matisse and there was only Matisse because there's something like that where he was like, nobody could be Matisse. And I think Fosse felt that way about Jerome Robbins. So certainly he's one uh, that I would love to see and work on. Um, there are stars like Sid Charisse that I would love to see or Juliet Prowse, stories that are personal stories of their uh, unknown and maybe geniuses in a, in a way that most people don't know that I think would be interesting. Um, gosh, there's musicians. There's so many people that I would love. I, I love it. I think the eight part series exploring one person in a fictionalized or two people for this matter. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, well, we can, well, the name, you know, there are names that come to mind. I, I would love to see, like you know Rogers and Hammerstein, or yeah. or or maybe maybe I'd love to see an Arthur Lawrence one. Yeah, yeah, that would be so exciting. I I totally agree with you. I think there's a lot of room for for that, don't you? I think there's such a such space for it. Oh, it's such such space, and and as this show has proven, such an audience uh, yeah. for it, uh, especially if it helps bring. Um, Gwen, you know, to more people's consciousness. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think when I dove into her story and I got to hear more of her history, I was blown away by that woman. I was just blown away. I mean, gosh, she was so strong. She was such a talent. She was willing to put herself in some, at some time second to him and su only support him and her daughter and, um, and yet still want, ambition and her own life. And I think that that struggle is, is still true to this day. Like, how do you have it all? How do you be an artist and have everything else that life can give you or that you want? Um, those are real. Those are difficult questions for artists, every artist out there balancing finance with money, with what you really want to do versus what you have to do. You know, it's, it's challenging. Well, uh, th the show is just is just magnificent. Uh, uh, Susan Meisner, thank you so much. Um, everybody go to goldderby.com, uh, log on to your, uh, and make predictions for Emmys, Tonys, Oscars, Grammys, and stay tuned to this channel for more uh, interviews with awards contenders throughout the season. Susan, uh, congratulations, thank you so much. Thanks, Tony.